Good evening. Can we call the meeting to order? We have a roll call, please, Beth. Mayor Cavanaugh? Here. Vice Mayor Magazine? Here. Councilmember DePorter? Here. Councilmember Yates? Present. Councilmember Brown? Here. Councilmember Tullis? Here. Councilmember Leger? Here. All right, thank you. Discussion with possible direction to staff regarding the 10 year budget overview, including revenue options. Grady? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Mayor and Council, and for the public here tonight. I uh, just want to provide a little bit of background on why we are here tonight. Um, you will recall that at the Council uh, retreat that we looked at projected um, revenues and expenditures for the next five years. And we, while things looked like they had improved a little bit in terms of the revenue shortfall coming down from a, a six million last year to about three and a half, three point seven million um, in five years. Um, nevertheless, we still have a, a revenue shortfall that we have projected. And during that session that we had with the council at the retreat, the council directed staff to come back and look at all the different items that we may have deferred over the years, um, such as maintenance and pavement management and the capital replacement fund and staffing where we've cut back on staffing. And so that's what we've done. And I believe um, after I've looked at what our staff has done, they've done a really good job. The department heads work very closely with their um, staff in identifying those areas where we have either deferred maintenance or have not adequately um, you know, plan for the future because the resources that we had just would not be able to afford to pay for these things. So um, before you tonight, um, Craig and I will be tag teaming, but Craig's going to go through a presentation that will include the 10-year projection that includes um, both the on the expenditure side, um, a number of items, and then what those drivers are going to be over the next 10 years, and also the, the revenues. And then, of course, that will show um, an even wider gap than what you saw back in February when you were looking at the five-year projection. So um, with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to uh, Mr. Rudolphy, our finance director, who's going to go over um, this presentation. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, you asked us to prepare a 10-year projection. It was not an easy challenge. Um, we have difficulty looking into our crystal ball for the next year, let alone five years and now 10 years. But with the assistance of staff, we put our heads together, tried to come up with all the revenue options that we could think of, as well as identify all of the deferred items that we have set aside um, in order to keep the town functioning. So hopefully this presentation will be informative and enlightening Feel free to interrupt me for questions. So first, I'd like to start with a kind of a recap of what our challenges are, just to refresh everybody's memory and to uh, set the stage for what's to come. So as we all know, um, and has been presented before, our general fund revenues are not keeping up with our operating costs. Um, as the town manager pointed out, our anticipated Cumulative shortfall in the next five years is 3.7 million. That is down from the five and a half or so that we had projected last year. Also pointed out that state shared revenue is roughly the same as it was in fiscal year five and six, which was 5.3 million. As we know, other cities can grow in population, but as they do, the Fountain Hills portion of the state shared revenues will continue to decline since it's based on population. PERF has been declining for a variety of reasons, lower gas tax revenues, um, legislature using the, the HERF monies to fund Department of Public Safety, and more efficient vehicles. And as you all know, our sales tax can go up or down based on the economy and that has happened in the not distant future, in the not recent past. So we're trying to, in the past, address um, with our residents both sales tax and primary property taxes. Uh, as we know, the primary tax pos possibilities have been defeated in the past. As a result, staff made significant cuts in staffing and has contracted out multitude of services for right-of-way maintenance and other things. 
we've done about as much as we can, and any future cuts are going to have a def definite negative impact on our residents. The savings that was reaped from the um, contracting out of services has pretty much been eaten up by the increase in prices. We have, in my opinion, we have a structural issue that needs to be faced. And also, in my opinion, it's a more of a revenue problem than it is an expenditure problem. So to kind of set the stage, two years ago, our then current town manager brought up the issue of the expenditure limitation. This is a slide that we used two years ago. The expenditure limitation um, has been in effect since 1980. Didn't affect us because we weren't around back in 1980, but it did starting in 1989. Annually, the Economic Estimates Commission gives us a state-imposed expenditure limitation in February. The calculations are based on the GD GDP implicit price deflator adjusting for inflation and population changes. And so if somebody asks me to calculate what the expenditure limitation is for next year, I will be unable to do that because I cannot do it based on GDP implicit price deflator adjusting for inflation and population. Um, there are a multitude of exceptions or exemptions that can be applied in the calculating the expenditure limitation. Any city or town can do one of two things. They can have a permanent adjustment or they can have a um, opt to have a home rule. Either one requires a vote of the citizens. Um, if we choose to go the permanent adjustment to the base, then it can only be held per statute and the next general council election, which will not be until August of 2018. Just for some background, um, year ended June 30th of 16. We were under the limit by $11.5 million. Our estimate for the current fiscal year is 16 17. We're only going to be under $100,000. And then for the next year upcoming budget, 17 18, we are estimating we're going to be 1.8 million under the budget, under the limit. And I'll explain that a little bit further as to why we seem to be so close this year. And Craig, if I could just kind of jump in and explain. So when we were looking at the different revenue options, um, we were wanting to just be um, aware of the expenditure limitation that's imposed by the state because we wanted to make sure any of these options that were generating more revenue, that we were gonna be able to stay within the cap that's imposed by the state. And uh, Craig's going to go ahead and talk a little bit more about some of the exceptions to that. Um, and uh, But as we're looking at these different options, we were looking at this. But as it turns out, this is probably going to be more or less a non-issue for us. And we'll go into that in a little bit. Mayor? Mm -hmm. uh, Vice Mayor? Uh, Craig, doesn't the um, draft budget of 17-18 indicate uh, 450000 It does. Um, as a result of that number and then some questions from the town manager, we contacted our outside auditors, Heinfeld and Meech, and had them come out Monday morning and sit with myself and our accountant. And we reworked the expenditure calculation so that we would better understand the calculation and be able to move, provide a better number. So because of that recalculation, our number has changed. Could you just repeat what the number is? Uh, 1.8 million for fiscal 1718. As I mentioned, there were several exemptions, exclusions, reductions in the calculation. The big one is that any item, any monies received that are not town generated funds, such as bond proceeds, such as grant recipient monies, such as donations or sponsorships. Those are not considered in the expenditure limitation. So when we get that money and then we spend it, that expenditure does not have to be counted toward the limit. The big influence is large CIP projects. As you all know, for the last several years, in our proposed CIP plan, we have included a Darrow Canyon and the fire station number two relocation. 
that's been in the budget for at least three years now and has been budgeted between five and six million dollars a year. If those monies are not spent, then they don't count toward the expenditure limitation. For example, our next year's budget, our current year's budget is estimated at 34 million. Included in that 34 million is five to six million for Adaro Canyon and the fire station. Using the 34 million as a starting point is where we come down to the 100,000 under the limit for fiscal 16-17. But we are not going to expend five to six million dollars for Adaro Canyon or the fire station in fiscal 16-17. So that immediately reduces the amount of our budgeted expenditures and therefore correspondingly increases by a like amount the amount under the budget under the limit. So while I said we're for 1617 a hundred thousand under the limit, add five million dollars to that. So we're five million one hundred thousand dollars under the limit for 1617 our current year. Mm -hmm. um, Vice Mayor? Craig, does that uh, positively affect uh, the numbers on the shortfall? If we're not spending that money? The, the shortfall is projected starting in 17-18. Well, 17-18 is balanced and then going forward. So in 17-18, we did budget to spend those monies and I expect that we will spend the majority of those monies in 17-18. So they've already been accounted for in the five-year projection. But the expenditure limitation is a different animal altogether from the, the shortfall issue. So my last bullet is repeating, if the actual expenditures are less than budgeted expenditures, then the estimated, in our case, under limit is increased dollar for dollar for, dollar for, the, for that amount. On the next slide, if you can see it, but it's also in your handout. The, you can look at the column, the first column after fiscal year, budgeted expenditures. That is the amount that council has approved as the budget. The actual expenditures is what we've actually submitted, or that's what we've actually spent. So in fiscal 12, 11, 12, we budgeted $38 million. We only spent 16 million. In 12, 13, we budgeted 31 million only spent 17 million. Once again, the direct result of having some fairly significant capital improvement plan projects that were not undertaken. So if you look at 1516, which was last year, we budgeted 36, we spent actually spent 27, but using our exclusions as I mentioned before, what numbers are used for the calculation towards the expenditure limitation was only 15 million. That's the column labeled adjusted expenditures. The next column is the Economic Estimates Commission estimate. And so for last year, we were $11.5 million under. And you can see for those years previously, it's been in the $10 million range under budget. 1617, we budgeted 34 million, but as I said, we're not going to spend the majority of the money for Darrow Canyon or the fire station. So our, our actual expenditures are going to be at least $6 million less, and therefore we'll take our exclusions and exemptions to get down to our ex adjusted expenditure number, which I'm confident is going to be well under the 27 million, which is our expenditure limit. Next year, we've also budgeted 34 million. Uh, we will be spending the Adaro Canyon and Fire, Fire Station 2. The expenditure <coughs> limit went up a little bit, um, but with our exclusions and exemptions, I believe we're gonna be 1.8 million under the limit. That's my best guess today. Ask me tomorrow, I have, may have another best guess. <laughs> but historically, we haven't had two general fund type projects of that magnitude and expense. And so historically, like when we did Saguaro, the Saguaro 
um, that was a huge one. And that was what, um, eight million? Seven, seven to eight million. Seven, eight million. And that was bond. So bonded indebtedness is excluded. So, and so are like when we do projects like on Shea, we receive funding from, from MAG or through the state for you know, those improvements. So that doesn't count. So the good news here, we were wanting to do this analysis as part of the revenue options that we're gonna to present to you tonight because we wanted to make sure that we weren't gonna get in a situation where with the state imposed limitation that you know, we can collect the money but under the state you know, limitation on expenditures that we weren't gonna be able to spend it. We're pretty confident that there's not gonna be an issue um, but at some point in the foreseeable future, um, I would say that we probably need to go to voters at some point and do um, you know, one of the two options to um, address this. But I think we're fine in the near term and midterm future. So we don't have to really worry about this, I think for maybe uh, six to eight years out. So, but we wanted this analysis here because we wanted to see the impact once we, um, you know, if the council were to make some decisions on uh, revenue options. Before I go to the next slide, I just want to recall and remind council that in their packet materials for this presentation was an Excel file, large format Excel file with many lines um, that represented all of the anticipated increases in both revenues and expenditures. Unfortunately, the revenue list was a lot shorter than the expenditure lists. Um, and so our starting point for that was our, the basis was the five-year presentation that we made earlier and that we're using that results in a cumulative shortfall over that five-year period of 3.7 million. I then took that same projection and carried it out five more years. And that was our starting point for both revenues and expenditures. So the next slide talks about what our major drivers are. Um, of that long five page list of revenues and expenditures, three pages, three plus pages was expenditures. And of those expenditures, these are the big items. The pavement management program, um, we're saying we need two million a year for pavement maintenance. We need two million a year for pavement replacement. And then we wanted to increase our pavement ma maintenance, so we added another two million. <coughs> Public safety. Can we I, know that, that those. Mayor. Vice Mayor. Uh, yeah, quick question. Under the uh, limitation, maintenance, I understand, would count. Yes. Would pavement replacement, that, isn't that a capital project? If it is funded with debt, it would not count. If it is paid out of current revenues, it would count. I thought cap, okay. It, it's, it's semantics. We could call it capital, but if it's not bond funded, it's part of the calculation for the expenditure limit. Right, Saguaro is a good example. The other thing too, Craig, is the HERF money is, um, is not exempt because that's part of state shared revenue, right? Um, there is an exemption for some of the HERF expenditures. Um, that is the toughest part of the calculation and okay. I don't feel comfortable trying to explain it um, without a lot of paper. Sure. Public safety. Um, we have uh, budgeted at a 3% increase and MCSO, even though we for fiscal 17, 18 received a 2.6% reduction in fees, I still anticipate because of the lawsuits and the settlements for public employee personnel safety retirement that um, I put in a 10% increase per year. Capital Reserve Study um, was presented to Council earlier and it is recommending $960,000 annually for building up the, that fund to cover any of our anticipated replacement items. One of those replacement items is the lake liner. We have our, Shea, uh, we have our street widening projects both on Shea Boulevard and Fountain Hills Boulevard. 
those are one-time costs and they will probably be wrapped into a bond package. Um, so those costs would be or could be excluded. You'll see that quite prominently on the next slide. Parks, um, we are anticipating another community park and another neighborhood park, um, and those are the costs associated with that. And then we also have a new fire station, number three, that's currently being, development fees are currently being collected for that. The fees that we're collecting are not adequate to pay for the cost of construction of that station. But in addition to that, we then need to staff it and operate it. And so those are the costs um, that we anticipate needing for operating that station number three. Just a quick question about the MCSO contract. You put in 10%, but it was a 2.6% reduction, but the you left three, the- The three, 3 million 715 reflects mm -hmm. a 2.6 reduction. And then using that as a starting point, I went up 10% starting next fiscal year. Next fiscal 18, year. 18, 19. Okay, got it, thank you. Graphically, here's where we look. The yellow line is not our revenues. The lower line is our revenues. The big spike is due to those two widening projects, Shea and Fountain Hills Boulevard. So if we were to bond for those, then that spike would probably level itself out, but it would still continue on that trend upward. This is typically the same graph as I just showed you. The green is our revenue, the green is our operating expenditures, which is using the five year projection resulting in the 3.7 million and extrapolating that out to 10 years. The red is the revenues, adding in the projected future revenues. <clears throat> and then the blue incorporates all of the deferred items or wish list items that, I won't say wish list, the deferred items that uh, we feel are necessary to, I don't know if I have a good adjective for what we would like to, we feel the blue items would be necessary to continue to maintain the town in the manner that we have. Mayor. Yes, uh, Councilman Tolos. Thank you. Uh, a lot of information and a lot of yeses. To Absolutely. Extent, okay. Uh, the two largest expenses that we have with Rural Metro and Maricopa County Sheriff's Office uh, if you were to scale back those back and you were to bring those to a 2 to 3% increase, what would, what would our graphs look like? Um, the green line would be lower. Um, historically, we, we've had a contract with Rural Metro that has called for a 3%. Um, MCSO, if anybody would like to give me a better number, I'm more than happy to try it. Craig, can you go back two slides? And I think, I think there might be maybe a misunderstanding. So that column that says 10-year cost, that's the 10-year cost. That's not the incremental increase no, due to these drivers. So like to your point, uh, Council Member Tallis, when you look at the MCSO and it says 53 million, that's 53 million based on the 3.7 million with the <laughs> multipliers over the 10 years. So that's not, so that column there, when you're looking at all those items that are itemized, that's not taking into consideration the incremental increase over the 10 years. So it, it, does that make more sense to you, Dennis? <laughs> no, I was following pretty well. Okay, well, it's saying basically that you take We'll take the pavement maintenance, for instance, $2 million a year, and then you times that by 10, and you get to 20 million, okay? But that's the actual cost. It's not the continued increase over time. So that's, so that's what is happening, is that right column is showing the actual cost plus increases. 10% um, year after year. For MCSO, exactly. Which is, which is affecting the long-term projections of right. our shortfalls. 
Exactly. So, yeah. So if so if we were to look at what just happened, we had a two point two point six percent decrease in our Maricopa County Sheriff's Office budget. <coughs> so if we were to look at a two to three percent annually, when we're dealing with the number one expense of our community and we're and we're projecting a 10% every year, year over year. That's substantial. And, and council member, to your point, that is substantial. And um, what we believe, and we were just really dumbfounded for next fiscal year, that they did not have a significant increase. And a lot of it had to do with, they didn't have the numbers in yet from the public safety retirement system. And that is really what's driving our costs. We pay a, 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 a reimbursement basis, basically, actual cost of service contract, and we pay a pro rata share of their um, unfunded liability for the public safety retirement. And so we believe 10% is probably right in the neighborhood based on what we're hearing. Um, so that's just going to be probably around for the foreseeable future. They just didn't have that, the numbers run yet in time for this upcoming fiscal year. They admitted to us that they thought, you know, that the number should have been bigger, but they didn't want to guesstimate at that. They want to have an actual number. So, um, so that's we did our best based on the assumptions that we had at the time that this um, analysis was was produced. Okay, so just getting back to what Councilman Tola said, um, if this ten percent does turn into just three percent, how does that affect the overall projection? It would have a significant impact. Um, I have not computed that. Wouldn't take long to do. I'm not prepared to do okay. it while I stand here. Right, that's understandable. But as an okay. example, it would be like, um, you know, instead of 371,000, it would be about 120,000 or so, mm -hmm. 125,000. So you see what that's like over the next two, uh, 10 years. It'd be mm -hmm. instead of um, 3.7 million, it would be roughly 1.2 or 1.3 million. Does that make sense? Yeah. Do you know the answer? Oh, I'm, sorry. No, 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 I don't. I'm looking for the answer. It'd be, it'd be about a third. One verse, uh, verse 3.7. Right, it'd be a third of that. Isn't the truth? Mayor, if I may. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, um, MCSO, the, the annual contract is $3 million, right? Three million seven hundred and fifteen. So, if you add three, and that's without is that that's without the um, increase. That's what we're paying currently. Correct. That, uh, three million seven is what we will pay for seventeen eighteen. So, if you add three percent to that, four percent, ten percent, that number is just only going to increase. Correct. Okay. So the fifty three million dollars is based on um, <coughs> ten times. 3.7 increased by 10%. Correct. Annually, yes. Okay, very good. So the regular, the 10 year cost with no increase is 37 million. So the difference between 37 and 53 is, I can do the math, 16. Um, so, and that represents 10%. So if we take a third of that 16, it'd be 5 million. So the 53 would really be like 42. The $1.6 million a year difference. Um, over 10 years, which is $16 million. Yes, but it wouldn't happen over 10 years. I mean, it wouldn't be 1.6 annually. It would be an increasing amount. Yeah. Vice Mayor? Uh, I would certainly hope that it's not 10%, but my understanding, and correct me on this, Grady, but as I understand it, the legislature changed the formula in 2011, um, and the court said that all of that money uh, that was... Uh, not that was basically not put in the fund from 2011 to present day has to be made up and refunded as well. Refunded mm -hmm. and going forward, it has to remain the same. Is that correct? That's correct. And so, so, th so that voter ballot item that was approved, um, I think a year ago or so, um, it's it's not going to have quite the positive impact as we were hoping it would have where basically they were going to re amortize the whole unfunded liability for all the agencies. It's going to be wiped out, and then we're going to have to be making up. So we're talking money. about a lot of money that has to right. be made up. And if it doesn't come from the cities and towns, uh, I wonder where it's going to come from.
Mayor, if I may, I had a question on. Sure. Um, thank mm -hmm. you. Craig, could you go back to the, slot, uh, the, the graph? Well, either one would work. Uh, well, actually, go, yeah, that one there. No, the, the other one. The one before, the prior. Okay. prior. Um, so when I, when I look at what our projected expenditures are annually and our uh, projected uh, revenues, I, I average about, I mean, Next year it's four million. Prior, the, the the shortfall we'll call it a shortfall. It goes four million, five million, six million, eight, seven million, nine million, sixteen million, eight million, and eight million. So even if we go back and redo the formulas, and by some miracle, MCSO has not increased historically greater than three percent, we st we still have a, a significant shortfall. I believe we do. Yes. Okay. First question. My second question is, as we look at the revenues, um, and I had an opportunity to look at your spreadsheets, thank you for those. Um, as far as I can see, the projections in there include all the projects that are kind of ramping up uh, moving forward. Could you just um, list what those, pro what those projects are, the revenue from those projects that was included in the analysis? I'm looking for our development services director. <laughs> he provided the projections, and correct me if I might be wrong. We have. Well, I mean, I, I can help you with it because it was in the presentation. Yeah, I mean, what, what's the revenue for Park Place is in there, right? All phases. The revenue for Copper Wind, all phases, is in there. The, the revenue for. Um, for Copper Wind, we assumed that it was only going to be the 200 Fa room. Phase one. I'll let him speak. All I'm trying to clarify, and, and we don't have to get you know split hairs, is that you have projected all of the revenue that we can see in the near future with respect to the projects that are ramping up in queue and moving forward. That's correct. We also included the state trust land, which question. you did include the state trust land. Okay, which is not in queue. Correct. Okay, so if nothing happens there, then our revenue would projections would even be lower. Okay, thank you. So here is what staff was able to come up with for possible revenue options. These are essentially the same as were presented at the council retreat in February. Increase in sales tax. Craig, I'm, I apologize for interrupting. Um, so if you were to normalize, say, an average, and I think what council member Leger was getting at is if you looked at what our needs would be to be able to support the 10-year projection, it averages about six million dollars a year. Correct. That, that so, not only the issue that we have with a three point seven million dollar shortfall in two years, that begins in two years, but basically we have um, an average of six million dollars a year increases that we need to be able not increases, but if you leveled it for ten years, it's six million dollars a year that we have to be able to support, and the revenue is just not there. So that, that, I'm only mentioning that because when we're looking at these, these options here, you have to kind of have an idea as to what we need to generate each year to be able to get to that $6 million number. Yeah. Councilman Tallis. So um, thank you, Mayor. So uh, when you just indicated that you had calculated in Park Place, Copper Wind, and the state trust land, I'm thinking, and correct me if I'm wrong, if you're dealing with Park Place, you're dealing with the construction costs, the revenues from the construction expenses that are coming to the town? Is that what you're calculating? When We're you're calculating the permit revenue. Okay. Yes. Okay. In Copperwind, same, same concept, that that's the revenue you're adjusting, or are you talking about also bed tax? For Copper Wind, we have used the projection they provided to us, which includes the bed tax as well as any incremental sales. Okay, and in, in the park place, are you including rental tax on the 400 units that are going to be there? 
I no. believe we did, didn't we? Pardon me? Did, we didn't include that? I do not believe we did. Okay, so in on the state trust land, we right now, based on the Elman project, it was 1,250 roughly homes, but we are now hoping that we're gonna have cooperation from the state and that we're gonna have a developer that we may have upwards of 1,800 homes. Are you looking at the construction permitting uh, revenue from that? Is that what you're calculating in yes, your projection? Yes, we are. Okay, so my question would be this. If we're looking at, in a 10-year forecast, 400 new residents downtown, on average, you know, call it a little less than two on average is what I think the statistics typically look at. So you're adding maybe 1,000 some odd people downtown. You've got maybe 1,800 homes, let's call it 1,500 in the state trust land that now we're looking at maybe another 5,000 people that are gonna be contributing to our sales tax revenues model right now. Are any of those projections included in this model of what is the impact, economic impact, of all the people and the population we're gonna bring into this community? Is that in the model too? It is not. Okay. Yeah. And, and let me just kind of address a couple questions um, or points. If you go back to the driver slide, um, the, the additional population, while it will help with the sales tax, to your point, Council Member Tallis, um, it's also a big driver. It's requiring us to build a, a, and staff a fire station. So a fire station just to, to build is probably, you know, in that 10-year period is going to be um, quite expensive. And I believe the annual cost of operating, it's about a million dollars. The, we don't receive, when you build and you have more people in town, it, it helps population wise, but there's also then the net increase for services. And so we'll probably have to increase police, which we haven't even gotten into, the police beats. And there's also um, more wear and tear on our roads and, and the you know, maintenance for parks and, and all that. So I'm not, I'm not trying to be a, a naysayer, but I'm just trying to say really growth um, we try to have growth pay for itself during the construction aspects. And a lot of the revenues we, we get for um, the new homes, like the construction sales tax, is really one-time use. And that goes towards our capital program. So it's, it's not like we're gonna be making lots of money off these people. And then the other thing is on the state shared revenue, our state shared revenue, while we'll probably um, go up a little bit, say by the 5,000 people that we have here, um, it's not, we're not growing at the same rate or pace of the other cities. And so our slice of the pie still is getting smaller out of the overall state shared revenue fund. So I'm, I'm just bringing that up because I, I, if we were growing at a faster clip and we were a bigger city, it would be a significant um, revenue advantage. So I'm sorry, I just wanted to just bring those points up. Councilman Farrell. Thank you, Mayor. That's a great explanation. I think we also need to add to that explanation the simple fact that if this if the state uh, isn't careful and they change the transaction privilege tax regulations for the general contractors, the only place we'll be receiving sales tax will be from Ace Hardware and the tractor store because we don't have a lumber or a, a roofing distributor or, or anybody else that's going to pay any of the taxes. So we need to watch that very carefully because I don't know what the percentage of revenue from from construction is, but it's significant enough that it affects us annually when we aren't building. Councilman Tolis. Thank you, and, and there's no question that we have some challenging times, but my point is, is that if we're gonna model this and we're gonna pre present this, that I think we have to put all of the calculations in and all of the projections that also include the additional revenue. And, and in my own analysis of where our town is right now, and this is again, you know, I'm all due respect, you have tremendous experience and I appreciate everything you're doing and we need to listen to you. But at the same token, I think to myself, you know, we on, on average have 20,000 people, let's say, year round here. So the fluctuation, you have the snowbirds, you have, okay, so let's, let's call it 20, right? If we're gonna go to 25, if we're gonna look at 
a chart, and I and I wanted. I wish you had this chart because I looked at it, and I didn't see the same. And it, and I want you to correct me if I'm wrong. I didn't see the same uh, facts as what you're saying here. Now you said the town's local sales tax is elastic and subject to fluctuations. Correct. Okay. Now I I looked at that sales tax and over the last eight years. It appeared to me, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, that we were on average right about $8 million in sales tax revenues. So logically, I just think to myself, you know, if we're looking at adding 5,000 more permanent residents to this community, is it out of line to think that we would add roughly $4 million in sales tax revenues from that addition? And, and again, this is discussion, this is what tonight's for. Help me understand your perspective of that and whether that's all in this model. And, and let me clarify, I'm having this discussion and I understand we, we have some challenges, but I just want to make sure that we don't jump the gun and make a recommendation that is premature in, in moving forward with some sort of a recommendation that's going to uh, ask the residents for more taxation, let's say, okay? Mayor, if I may. Did you want to answer that or? I, I can offer a brief answer. Uh, I think four million additional in sales tax is very high. I, Eight million on average, I believe, is probably a good number for what we have now. Um, to add four million with just 5,000 more residents, I don't think is realistic, but I've not done the math. You may be more accurate than I am. Mayor, but. Um, Vice Mayor. All right, I'll let you go first. Um, I, I like your optimism. You know what? Let's do the math, though. Let's say, optimistically, we're adding $4 million in sales tax revenue, which I think is a stretch. What's 2.6% of that? Certainly not $4 million. And we've talked about this several times before. We need to increase our economy by $40 million in sales. $40 million in sales to generate $1,040,000. million. $40 million to generate a million. <clears throat> We're looking at projections here that are averaging about $6 million shortfall a year. Well, let's womp off a million for some of the reasons you mentioned. Let's say we're down to $5 million. $40 million in sales revenue isn't going to happen, but optimistically, if it does happen, now we're down to a $4 million deficit. And there's many of us that sat here during the downturn in the economy, and our revenues were, were anemic, and we're still paying for that. We're still paying for managing our way through that crisis in terms of facilities, roads, so forth and so on. So I can be optimistic, but at the end of the day, it's the math. Four million times 2.6% doesn't generate a whole lot of revenue. Where are you, where are you, I'm coming up with, you know, four million in, in net. I'm not, I'm not taking 2.6. Four million would come from the accumulation of the sales tax revenues from the increase in the population that we have. So if we have $8 million right now in sales tax <coughs> revenues, and you add the density, and you add the downtown district, and you add all of this commerce, I'm thinking that. So you, yeah, and. and you're not coming up with 2.6 of 4 million. Okay, so Mayor, if I may, <clears throat> I'm just trying to work through this. Um, okay, I'll be optimistic. So you're saying in raw revenue, to us is $4 million. I'm saying we go from 8 to 12 with the addition of the downtown project, the copper wind, the increase in our tourism. That, okay. We have, if you're, if you're calculating in, uh, in your projections that the state trust land is going to be developed, we're going to have another four to 5,000 residents in this community. Okay. And it, I just think that we need to look at all of these factors and make sure that when we present these shortfalls that we're looking at a number of different models. And, you know, we brought up the one comment about MCSO with 10% increase every year. That's $16 million in 10 years. If you take $16 million off of this graph of the revenue shortfalls, we have a balanced budget. So we've, we've got to look at this and just make sure that we really dig 
deep and we evaluate everything. That's all I'm suggesting. Mayor, if I may. Councilman uh, Brown. Thank, thank you, Mayor. So if we uh, round numbers have 25,000 people today and we were coming up with $8 million, that's more like a $1.6 million increase. My ex example, I said 20,000 20, people on average, not 25, but 20. Okay. Yeah. So before two, two, two yeah. million dollars a year. Right. Okay. Vice Mayor. We seem to be making a lot of assumptions. Uh, for example, who's to say that all of these people are going to be coming from outside of Fountain Hills? Um, what percentage of them will be people who already live here? Um, we don't know what the population is going to be. With regard to the trust lands, tell me when the state's going to make a decision. Tell me what developer, when a developer is going to start work and do the engineering. Tell me when a developer is going to put the first homes online. Tell me when they're first going to be occupied. What do we do in the meantime? I mean, we could be talking many years. If you look at this information, and if you assumed, Art, I agree, it's a discussion. I mean, you're assuming the best, and um, you're trying to be realistic, but so am I. Um, what do we do in the next number of years uh, if, if those optimistic projections are wrong? What do we do next year or the year after? That money isn't going to just start flowing in from these developments. I do not believe we can grow our way out of this no matter what. Here, if I may. Anything else? Uh, I, let me make sure that um, Councilman Yates is not forgotten. He got cut off. Oh, did he? He just notified me. Oh, okay. I didn't want to forget him up there. <laughs> okay. This is a discussion. This is not to be argumentative. This is what tonight's for, is to bring up these types of discussion points. We, we talked a lot about this at our retreat back in January, and we talked about a number of ideas in regards to development, and I know we talked about the, state, the, the Shea development, the, or the Shea property that the town owns, and how can we maximize the revenues, and what can we do to develop that property. We had a lot of thoughts at our retreat. So uh, again, this is for discussion. Please don't take me in, a, in an argumentative way. I just have asked a lot of questions and you've answered them and you indicated, you know you did not include that in the projections. So it seems like maybe some of the things I'm saying are valid, that we need to put it all in the bucket and then really look at a model and come up with a solution, which clearly we need solutions, okay? So, I'm not debating that. Mayor, if, uh, yes, Councilman DePorter. I was just, I was just going to ask if, if we could go through the suggestions that, that the staff had and then have, have at it at this conversation after that. Okay, we could do that. Is that okay? Let's go on. Let me address some of uh, Councilman Tolis' points. Um, GPEC okay. did a study it's for us. <laughs> Just so while we're on that thing, okay. GPEC did a study for us on the impact of copper wind and their cumulative 10-year projection of total economic impact, direct and indirect, was 3.5 million. Then our economic development director um, prepared an analysis of total TPT projections. For 2017, he projected that there were 11,349 households and they would generate 9.69 million in total TPT collections. And that's roughly in line with our 8 million because it has been increasing. In 2027, their projection is 13,000 households, but only 11.1 million in total TPT collections. So TPT collections would go up by about a million and a half dollars over that 10 year period. Moving right along. Sales tax, um, as Councilman LeJay mentioned, um, it's gonna require a lot of sales to generate a significant impact in collections for the town. Um, every 0.1% would generate $340,000. We 
We are now at 8.9 percent. Previously, I believe at the council retreat, I had passed out a handout that listed all the communities within the county and what their sales tax collections rate is. I don't have that with me tonight, but I can then easily provide that again if you would like to have that. Another option, public safety fee. Um, I'm using the same household that uh, ED used for their projection in 17, 11,349. A $100 fee would generate 1.2 million in revenue. If, uh, Mayor. Vice Mayor. Before you go on, I think it's important to point out, if I'm correct, that under the public safety fee, wouldn't everybody pay the same amount? That is correct. Regardless, I mean, Target would play the same as I would pay. And every, I think. At a flat $100, yes. Well, why would it make any difference how much it is? They'd still everybody <laughs> pay the same, wouldn't they? Yes, if, if that's how council implemented the fee. Is there another way to implement it? Uh, by looking I, I, at our town council, no, there is not. That, that's what I thought. So no matter how much it is, 100, 200, whatever, it, everybody pays the same. Yes. That's what I want to know. And could you specify which of these are council approved and which of them are voter approved? Just so everyone who's Sales listening. tax is strictly council's option. Public safety fee is strictly council's option. Special district. Um, we have one community facilities district in town, Eagle Mountain. Um, existing law does not allow for a special district to cover both police and fire, and this would require a vote of the residents. As I understand it, because of it was dissolved, it would be very difficult, the legislature Andrew, maybe you can answer that question. Legislature would have to approve the formation of a district. It's very complicated steps. I think we looked into that. Um, Mayor, members of the council, there are there's actually two separate issues here. One is a, I guess, a reformation of, of what is essentially a county fire district model that was here before. Um, that has a separate governing body, separately elected, has a formation process that's currently in the statute. What doesn't exist in the statute right now is a process for a city or town to create a fire district over its boundaries. But there's a similar type of formation that was created in uh, about four, three or four years ago now uh, to allow for formation in a county island area outside of Gilbert was the, the driving force. That's a pretty good model for how it could be implemented at a city or town level, but that would require legislative change. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Other options, a franchise fee, um, that would generate about 200000 annually, and that would be council approved, I believe. Going to be corrected now? Yeah, Fran franchise fees are another interesting issue. You have um, a number of, well, not a number of, I think you have two users of your rights of way uh, who are supposed to have franchises and do not. Um, the publicly regulated entities like the water company have the authority to charge a franchise fee as part of their rate and, and fee schedule so that if the town were to authorize a franchise fee it would be able to be passed through under their current approvals uh, but a franchise in Arizona has to be granted via a vote of the town and they're granted for periods of 25 years uh, it's based upon whatever percentage you vote in at the, at the election, but it's a town election for a franchise fee. Okay, any questions on any of that before we go on? Okay. We currently have a outside auditor, Al Holler and Associates, that um, pursues residential rental taxes for us. Um, How's that going? Mm. We're not reaping the benefits that we anticipated. Are we able to find, though, as many as we think are out there? Or is it just that he can't find them? We can find a lot more than he and his staff have time to look at. It probably takes a good four to five hours 
given an address to be able to just get the necessary background to know whether that's a possibility. Mm -hmm. And from there, we have to then contact the, the resident, find out if they're actually paying tax, look them up in DOR's register. If we do conduct an audit, it's typically a month to two months to conduct. Then by the recent change with DOR, all audit results are provided to DOR. They then assume responsibility for collection and their tax collection staff has been dramatically reduced. I think they have six maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and they are looking at the total tax due to the state. And if we're looking at a 5000 dollar amount that they owe the town it might be 20,000 that is owed to the state but they're over they're looking at the million dollar accounts and pursuing those so we have a variety of challenges to to try to ramp up the residential rental and I understand it's particularly difficult if a home is owned by a Canadian resident by someone who's a who has two homes, one here, one rental, and they actually are Canadian residents because they have no social security number, is that right? Correct. They have a Canadian ID that is not registered any place, so mm -hmm. we can't track them through DOR. Mm -hmm. And how, um, how do you anticipate it's gonna work? We have quite a few homes that are being rented through Airbnb, and now that Airbnb is supposed to be collecting the tax. Do you anticipate that that's going to bring in more revenue, that they're going to be more efficient in that, or what do you think? I'm just asking for your best guess. That's it. Um, I, I don't know that efficiency has anything to do with it. Um, under the contract they signed with DOR, they are responsible for collecting this rental tax for mm -hmm. any listing that they sponsor. And they are paying a lump sum total to DOR and not identifying the individual taxpayers. So we wouldn't be able to determine if they owed us back taxes? We could not. Okay. Or, nor could we determine who they are paying for. Okay. Thank you. We could raise town fees. And so listed here are some of the examples of the amounts that we've collected in the most recent completed fiscal year. Um, in all of 15-16, we collected $466,000. Um, it would be a more than a significant increase to raise those fees to get us the revenue that we anticipate we're going to need. But those are subject to council approval. Primary property tax would require a vote of the residents. Um, I've listed the various home values as well as what the tax would be based on various values of homes, three, six, nine, and 12. No, I'm sorry. That's the amount of revenue that would be raised. If we wanted $3 million for a $250,000 home, that would be $177,000 $177 annually that they would be paying. If we wanted to raise $12 million for that same home, it would be $708 the resident would pay. And I believe I said that it does require a vote of the residents. Then flipping the coin and looking at the other side, how can we reduce expenditures? Um, we could reduce service level, levels, close the community center, reduce the fountain operating time. We could reduce coverage for police and fire. Um, the last time we looked at reducing police, we asked to go from 3.8 to 3.4 beats, and that was a savings of 215,000. So adjusted for current dollars, it'd about, be about 300,000 annually. Uh, reduce staff. Um, we could try mandatory staff furloughs. Each day would get us about 12 to 14,000 dollars. Um, or we could try f identifying more services that we could contract out. That would be a effort in developing comprehensive requests for proposals and drafting them and then evaluating them. 
and savings wouldn't be determined until those responses are received. Councilman Brown has a question. Uh, not a question as much as a statement. You know, we're looking at a $6 million shortfall and everything you presented to us is, in my opinion, a Band-Aid. Mm -hmm. And of course, we're looking at, in my profession, it's called a WAG. And on, even though it's an educated WAG, it's a great guess. And looking 10 years into the future, as you started your presentation, looking 10 years into the future is totally impossible to do especially with the way that Fountain Hills is growing and then not growing and what we're going through internationally, et cetera, et cetera. So I think, I think we need to quit talking about a $215,000 savings annually or, you know, unless, unless we want to just do it all. And, you know, if we do it all, then we'll have enough savings to count or, and if we implement a sales tax and a public service fee and, and uh, the special districts option and sales uh, property tax, then we might be able to talk about having enough money to go back and fix what we haven't fixed for the last 30 years and then have enough money to let our town grow properly in the near future. So I think, I think we are up here with great intentions and I think you have done an incredible job, staff included, but I think that we are not addressing the problem and the problem needs to be addressed. We're not talking $215,000, we're talking $6 million and we need to address that problem. So I, I've got, I, you know, I'm not sitting here prepared to make a recommendation. Councilman Member Yates before, and he apologized for not being able to be here tonight. He, he called and asked me to bring up the idea of a um, uh, facilities maintenance district and I would ask if I could I'd like Andrew to address this a little bit I I didn't fully understand it but it sounded to be more feasible in the in the light of being able to tell the residents of Fountain Hills your money is going to be spent for ABC opposed to a property tax where it's can be spent for other items uh, Madam Mayor Councilmember Brown I'm going to <clears throat> have to guess a bit at what Councilmember Yates is referring to. I know that he and I have discussed a number of different things that are currently existing in state statute that are um, untested in the way that we're talking about them. Um, the only districts that we've formed so far in the town uh, are fairly small. I mean, the community facilities district in Eagle Mountain is is over a fairly decent sized area, but as compared to the whole town, it's significantly smaller than the whole. Uh, the community facility district idea is to expand that concept over the entire town area. Um, the, one of the challenges is that you already have one in Eagle Mountain, so you have a potential for overlapping districts. And I don't know that we have those in the state, but we potentially do. Um, improvement districts like the Cottonwoods district, there are some versions that appear to have a broader range to allow for those areas. You know, some of the, the things that we've talked about are akin to like what was in existence in Fountain Hills before the town incorporated with the road districts. Um, so there are a number of tools that may be available, but haven't been used that way before, I think is the best way I can describe them. Um, and, you know, with some legislative tweaks, some of them could be usable as well to try and create things like road districts or other districts uh, so that you have a specific purpose for them rather than having just a general taxation. But in the end, um, we haven't pursued anything beyond just that discussion because I don't have any direction from all of you to, to go down that road. It might be quite extensive. Did you have anything else, Vice Mayor? Well, I'm just going to ask for a bit of clarification. Um, Councilman Brown, did you say that um, your understanding from Councilman Yates is that we'd specify where the money is going to be spent? That's, you know, we've, we've tried to, we've, the Town of Fountain Hills has tried twice to pass a property tax, and both times it was beat up badly, 80-20. And when we finally presented the Saguaro Road Bond correctly, it passed 
8818 or something, 8812. And it was, it was presented properly, and, and I think his intent was saying that opposed to, uh, we, we've got a lot of things to look at. I don't know, I don't know that we have everything on the table. I don't know that our toolbox is full to come up with a good solution after looking at the possibility of doing a district, after the possibility of, of um, uh, bringing back a road district. You know, I think, I think we need to meet and, and really look at, because I don't think we've got all of our options listed on, these, on, the, on the six pages that we're looking at. So, you know, I'm, I, frankly, I am totally ready to put a, a property tax on the line and try to sell it because if we don't do something in the town of Fountain Hills and if we don't do something fairly quickly, we're going to be in deeper, prop, deeper trouble. Our real estate values will start to go down. Our staff will be walking off the job because they are unhappy and beat up by the citizens of the town as well as the council, but the council's elected to take care of this town, and I think that's what we need to be talking about. Follow up. I'm, Vice Mayor? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just a little confused by what you said. He's saying that you would delay doing anything until we look at some other options? Absolutely. I don't think we've got all the options. You know, the, we, we've got a list of Band-Aids, and then we've got a property tax. Because everything else on here is a Band-Aid. You can't go to the filling station with a dollar and a half and fill your car up anymore. And that's, in essence, what we're asking to do with the Band-Aids. I, I would just I would just say that, that that's fine. I would just, I'm starting to feel some real urgency. Um, <clears throat> talked uh, about all the possibilities for raising revenue, a lot of them, for quite a while. Uh, time is passing. Our situation is getting worse. So I would just uh, urge council and staff um, to set a timetable to get the information we need, to get it before us, and make a decision. Mm -hmm. Councilman Brown. So, Grady, what is the timeline on getting something put on a ballot? So my understanding is that this would be a May um, ballot item, so it would be May of next year, because we can't get on it, obviously, next month. So, and there's some uh, time periods that we have to meet in order for this to be on the ballot. Um, we have to work very closely, in my understanding, is with the county uh, elections, and we have to produce, you know, like a publicity pamphlet, and we have to get the language. Andrew's very active, or would be very active in, in assisting us with that. So do we know what those timelines are? We can, we can come back at a later time with that, um, but are, definitely Are we May talking about the uh, primary property tax time? That's what I think I'm anything, Wouldn't anything that is put on a ballot have the same timeline? What's different? Not, not exactly. Not um, exactly. Now, the, the primary property tax election is the one that has the strictest timeline because it can only be held on the May consolidated election date. So that one sets your time frame at about the first or second meeting in January of that year. Okay. You have to make the decision. So if you were going to be targeting May of 2018, your target time for having made a decision is January of 2018. The other types of districts or other things, those are on any of the four consolidated dates. So you're a little bit more flexible on those in general. Um, but if it's primary property tax, it's got to be May. Okay. Yes. So, thank you, Mayor. Mm -hmm. So does that answer your question as far as the time frame? So what would you say if I said let's have something decided before we go to Christmas break on the mm -hmm. December 25th of 17? <clears throat> then we'll have a thought, well thought out, good, well proposed plan. And in the meantime, Andrew could research the Community Facilities District, which Councilman Yates has um, been talking about as another possibility, or any other possibility that you know of that would um, be feasible for us to look at. Uh, and also to take into consideration um, the comments of Councilman Tolis in getting uh, the best true picture, including some of the items that he mentioned today. Because I, 
I, I don't think that we're saying it's going to make that much of a difference or it's going to make some difference, but we don't know. So I think that's very I think fair. we're all just <laughs> saying we want a total picture so that when we go into this, our eyes are open, we know exactly or pretty much the best possible guess, and then with all of the information we have here plus additional information about other possibilities, we would be able to make that decision in, in Mayor, time. Could I answer the council? I'm sorry, Mayor. No, well, you can sort of answer through me, but go ahead. Well, okay. Well, yeah. I, I, wonder, I, I didn't answer the question about timing because I wasn't certain. Mm -hmm. I'm a little concerned. I mean, we obviously can't campaign for it, but citizens can do whatever they want. And I just want to make sure they have sufficient time. And uh, I guess I would back it up another month or so if possible um, to like November. Uh, and during the holidays, not a lot's going to happen anyway. Uh, just to make sure that the, the citizens have enough time to learn what they need to learn for people if they want to uh, go out in favor of it uh, and, and hold any kind of meetings, whatever. Make mm -hmm. sure there's plenty of time for that. Well, I'm, not gonna can, quibble, I'm not going to quibble over a month, but you know. We can direct staff to do this as quickly as possible, but on the other hand, if the residents know that we have thoroughly investigated all possibilities and we are able to present all of it, they would probably be more favorable to our decision. I'll not argue with that. Okay. Anything else? Can, Councilman Leger? Yes, um, I would like to address the town attorney. Um, a community facilities district, is that what we're talking about? Um, Madam Mayor, Councilmember Leger, one of the discussions that, have, that I've had with Councilmember Yates was regarding utilizing a community facilities district in a broader way than it has been before. And would that require a change in the law or legislation to, to apply the model in, 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 in the way that is being recommended? It's my understanding that model doesn't exist to apply in that particular fashion. So would it have to go to the state legislature, I guess, is my question. We're uncertain whether or not that's the case. Okay. But it would require a vote of the town. Uh, the, the primary difference between utilizing a, a CFD that way and the way that it was used in Eagle Mountain, in Eagle Mountain, a CFD was primarily a tool for the developer to use publicly financed bonds as infrastructure payment. And so there's a single property owner at the time, so you can waive the election requirement. When you form a CFD over an area that's occupied by voters, you have a full-on election in order to form that as well. So you're, you're kind of in the same boat you are with the primary property tax. The difference is that you may have a limitation on the amount that you can levy in a given year for maintenance under that. And, and Mayor, if I may, um, so in that regard, um, it's my understanding, similar to a, 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 a bond, y you would have to be very specific in terms of how you're going to spend all this money. Is that correct? Um, CFDs have traditionally been targeted for specific infrastructure yes. that was known at the time. So you, you would have to list what every single item that the CFD is going to cover in terms of pushing this forward to the, the voters. And my last question, if I may, if we're successful at doing that, how, do we, how is this money collected? Via property tax. Thank you. <laughs> we've, we've come full circle. I'm kicking the can down the road. Well, I, I think the, as Councilman Yates has mentioned, the major difference is, and I think Councilman Brown mentioned also, is that residents like to know exactly where their money is going. That's not just going to general fund because they want to know how it's spent. The road bond was successful. Fix Saguaro, don't do anything else. That's what they wanted. They voted overwhelmingly for it, so we give them the option to say what exactly, where exactly this money is going, and it can't be used for anything else. And hopefully that um, would cause more of a positive reaction during an election. Mayor. Councilman Tolis? So uh, in January, we spent uh, over a half a day here in the retreat. And in, in our analysis and our moving forward with these timelines of coming up with a strategic plan that we're going to implement a solution to this, 
I would like to see, see the minutes from that meeting because I know that a lot of what we're talking about right now and a lot of the in, in, initiatives that we wanted to see happen were discussed at that meeting. And we're here now in April, and I feel like to a certain extent, this is uh, Groundhog Day. And, and I really feel like what has been accomplished, where are we at? And I can tell you, Copperwind development was passed. You see the downtown project, that's significantly advanced from where it was then. We, we did not talk about the great job that Scott Cooper's doing with economic development. And we have uh, a, a, what, a, what, what has been in the papers as a medical facility. I don't know if it's public what it is yet or not. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of it positive. It is now. <laughs> I didn't say the name of the company. I didn't say any names Thanks, of any company. So, you know, we have a lot of positive things happening. But we got to look at those minutes because, truly, we're, we are kicking the can down the road here. The same conversation we had in January, and here we are in April. And we, and we need to put double down on our efforts to work with the state and make sure that we're doing everything we can to, to create the environment for a strong development to happen at the trust land. I don't know what time frame that is. This facilities district and reviewing and looking at how we implement and what that's gonna take, we talked about that extensively at that retreat. And here we are in April and we still kinda of don't know the answers. We need answers. We need to know what it's gonna take and whether or not it's feasible. Because if it's not feasible, then take it off the table and let's not waste any time on it. And if we're continuing to go back to this primary property tax, then you know, let's get all the analysis, put all the things in, the, and figure out really where we're at. We're gonna have a nice meeting with the sheriff, Penzone's coming. Let's, let's address the fact that where are our projections going to be and what does he anticipate the sheriff's department and how are they going to cover these costs? I mean, let's have these real hard conversations and just get as many real answers as we can before we okay. move on any other Okay, option. and Grady, could you have those minutes available? You bet. Okay. You bet. Anything else? Then, anything else, Craig? Yes, I have to show my last slide. Oh, <laughs> okay. Which essentially says what we just talked about. Oh, good. I'm done. Then we did it. All right, um, any other council discussion? And I know we don't have any <coughs> speaker cards. Okay, then, let me just get a motion to adjourn. So moved. Uh, second? second. All in favor? Aye. Any approved? Okay, thank you, everyone. Good meeting.